Hi, we continue today in the judgment scenes of Babylon, the great whore, the great city in Revelation 17 and 18, moving today in the beginning of chapter 18. And as you can see on the right side of the screen, we've been following this with this chart of keywords and phrases color-coded to match all the way through 17 and 18. And we've gone through 17. Today we're going to look at the beginning of this angelic pronouncement of judgment and the call to come out. In chapter 8, we're just going to go through verse 1 to 3, right through this part up here. But then you can see as we move into the rest of the chapter, uh, especially the center of it, and we'll see the classic structure of that in a minute, we'll see this great lament of the great city repeated over and over again like a refrain. You see the great city through throughout, and the merchants, the uh, ship owners, and the kings lamenting that that cargo is lost. But a call for celebration, O heaven, you saints, apostles, and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. And it's really important that we remember that as we start. Even though the gendered language is problematic, and we're going to look again at that in just a moment, what we're seeing here is a judgment uh, by God on behalf, or I'm sorry, a judgment on the city of Babylon by God on behalf of its victims. Calling back to chapter 6 when we saw under the altar those who had lost their lives and witness for God and the Lamb crying out, How long, O Lord? And we've been seeing over and over again in recent chapters the promise was coming that judgment would, would be done against Babylon, and now here it is. And it'll continue through chapter 19 and through chapter 20, while ba as Babylon the beast and the dragon are all dispatched, allowing New Jerusalem to come down from heaven and be with its open gates, be there for anybody who'd like to join into it. And so today we'll just be looking at the beginning of this here. And there are several ways to, to look at the structure of Revelation 18. We're going to look at two of them here. Uh, one from uh, Catherine Maloney, and we'll look at uh, her article in a little bit that this is based on. She shows this parallel between the structure of the chapter and Amos 18, a judgment passage. And you see the category she includes there, the warning lament, both starting in the form of a dirge and then the admonitions and accusations, then the judgment woe oracle, oracle, and the, finally the reason for announcement of judgment, or the announcement of and reason for judgment. So that's one way to look at it, and you see the citation or article below. Another way from De Villiers, and you see the citation of the chapter uh, from which book this is taken that we see, shows a chiasm, and he shows it in much detail in the Greek, and I'm not going to belabor the details of the Greek, but he also notes how the section A here is itself an ABBA chiasm, and so is 2124. So a lot of close words. And so he shows the framing here of all nations at the beginning and at the end, and then the call to come out uh, framed in the middle by lament with the kings on one side, seafarers in the other, and the merchants in the middle. And we'll see that one aspect of that, we'll see the merchants mentioned today, uh, in the Roman culture of the time, mer to have merchants get rich uh, was to say something bad about Rome. Merchants were not deemed to be people worthy of praise. Uh, rather, they were seen as greedy and grasping and making money off doing nothing in particular, as opposed to uh, people who craft things or have farms and produce things from the earth, etc. So we'll see more about the sat satirical aspects of this, again, calling upon Sarah Emanuel's work on uh, satire and parody and as a form of Jewish humor, uh, roasting Rome, as she called it. So we'll see that as we go. We're also going to continue to look at Hebrew scriptures, and here my page changes. So I have to shift here from the bottom to the next page, and that's a little bit of a, a breach here, but you'll see how it goes. So the initial phrase echoing from Ezekiel and then the fallen we already saw in Revelation 14.8. Uh, echoing from Isaiah 21, and then in the verses that follow, more imagery from Jeremiah and Isaiah. Although some scholars suggest that Ezekiel is uh, a part of the uh, background here, and we'll see that later in chapter, uh, in verse 7, when we see the parallel with Tyre claiming to sit, uh, sit in the seat of the gods, parallel to Babylon saying, I rule as a queen. So we'll see more of that as we go. And again, one more time, we need to look at the issue here of Babylon the whore versus Babylon the city. Um, in our section here, uh, Babylon the great is described not either as whore or as city. And yet there's the gendered language of her there a uh, number of times throughout this, and the like, sexual language, at least metaphorically, of fornication. So we've looked before at scholars who have written whole books on Revelation arguing this out, especially women on both sides of it, Tina Pippin and Catherine Keller on the side of seeing John as a misogynist, or at least the language is misogynist and dangerous to women, and people like Elizabeth Schusler, Fiorenza, and Barbara Rossi on the other side seeing the metaphorical issue here and the uh, imagery 
have Babylon as a, as a whore, as an issue of idolatry, echoing from the prophets. Again, not a right answer, but uh, in one way or the other, but multiple ways of reading a text that is subject to multiple readings because of the kind of language it is. In articles, let's look at a few examples of women from different cultural lo social locations uh, trying to uh, discuss this issue as well in relation to Revelation 18 in particular. First here, uh, Rohan Park, who's at Vanderbilt. Uh, so she's at a U.S. university, but writing as a U.S. Korean in the experience of oppression by the Japanese, um, the Koreans as Japanese. And so she's writing in a, in a question of intercultural reading using post-colonial uh, and uh, imperial critiques out of her own experience. I wasn't able to get a picture of her uh, to illustrate this, but as you see, um, the note at the beginning uh, is about how this can be valuable from an East Asian global perspective to read it in terms of uh, the Roman context of, of John's own time. Um, that was in 2008. Just a few years later in 2011 is Marion Carson writing from Scotland and she's interested in the question of a real prostitution and whether dismissing um, Babylon here as violence against women diminishes the possibility of reading the text uh, on behalf of violence against women, um, which is to say that John's vision is not uh, um, not calling for violence against women, but God's judgment against a city, metaphorically, and therefore a revelation call for justice ought to still be there to um, support women who are involved in prostitution. She makes a very strong claim and claims that Pippin's way of reading is simply a misreading, and she even describes it as unsophisticated, which leads to a strong response We'll see it in just a minute from um, Pillay. Uh, meanwhile, here's Catherine Maloney from Australia, and as you can see from the abstract, she's concerned with the fate of um, oppressed garment workers in Bangladesh. Um, and there are many uh, immigrants in Australia, and many of those may be from there. I don't know the details of that. But she has experience concerned about that, and so she's looking at the role of collective lament, that this isn't just about individual lament, but collective lament in establishing collective responsibility and enabling collective repentance. And she cites Carson's article, but doesn't make that the focus of her work. Unlike here we can see from Miranda Pillay from the University of the Western Cape in South Africa, concerned about violence against women. And as a white woman, she's not addressing the racial issues here. She's addressing violence against women in general. But she fights back against Carson. And although she sees uh, Carson is right in saying that the gendered nature of Babylon as a city is a function of the standard tradition of calling cities female in the Hebrew Bible, she's not so quick uh, to let Carson get away with dismissing Pippin's work as a misreading, but thinks it really needs to be focused on so that people who are inclined toward violence against women or misogyny aren't further empowered through these verses in Revelation. So it's an ongoing battle and we come into the middle of it and I hope I don't need to say but I will say that uh, plainly anything I'm saying here ought not to ever be used for violence against anybody, women or anybody else. So with these cautions in mind let's keep up our structural uh, parallels here and we'll begin to look at these verses up close. Uh, so we begin after this, and that's already a highlight that although 17 and 18 are clearly connected in description of the fall of Babylon the whore, plainly there's a break here. Uh, the phrase metatauta is used a number of times to suggest a break in scene. The next one will be in chapter 19, 1, as you can see from my note below. And so it's highlighting there's a shift here. This is not just a continuous scene, and there's a different angel involved, so we need to look at that too. So after this, which is to say the previous angel's uh, explanation of the seven horns and the ten heads and the and the, um, the beast and the woman, the waters under the woman, now we see a new vision. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority with the earth, and the earth was made bright with his splendor in the new RSV. But splendor is doxa, otherwise glory. And it's important we look at that uh, up close to see the identity of the angel, at least the potential identity. Um, as some scholars have said, um, and you can see this from my note, hear about the other angel, um, that the angel is Christ is confirmed by the fact that every ascription of glory to a heavenly figure in the apocalypse refers to either God uh, or Christ. And that's certainly true of every ascription of glory to a heavenly figure, but it's not true of all the ascriptions of glory. And so we need to look a little more closely at that. So we can see all the examples of glory, and plainly all the ones up here you can see are glory to God or to the Lamb, and you know, we don't need to go over those in detail. And here's the one we're on here. But at the end we'll see human glory. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into New Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem, and people in general will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. So there is human glory to be made available, and it doesn't imply uh, necessarily that this angel is the Lamb, uh, which is to say God or the Lamb could be the only source. The fact that the angel is from heaven, well, all the angels are coming out of heaven, so that certainly doesn't seem to my ears to distinguish it from the human glory of peoples in general or the kings. Um, it could be Christ, and I have no reason to think it's not, but it would be odd if uh, John suddenly referred to Christ in this ab abstract way and had nothing about the human one or the lamb or anything like that. So uh, all we know is simply another angel coming down from heaven. But it's described in this way, having great authority here, um, and that is an echo from uh, excuse me, Ezekiel 43, as you saw from my other short chart. Um, authority is such a key word in Revelation, and I really want to highlight that because we're going to perhaps be surprised to find that in Revelation 18 there are a couple of words that are not key words in Revelation uh, that we might expect would be. So authority is used all the time here as we can see. Um, the earth was made bright with that splendor, um, which is to say with the glory. And so uh, all the lighting up of that uh, all around on the earth as well as in the sky. And what we hear the angel do is call out. And so many people describe this first section as a vision and the rest of it from verses 4 on as an explanation. But really the vision is just this first verse of the angel lighting up the earth with its splendor because all we hear in verse 2 and 3 is words coming from the mouth of the angel and no visual description at all. I mean, there's a visual description of the words, but we don't see that John sees what the angel is describing here. So let's look at that more closely. Uh, he called out with a mighty voice. In this case, it's not great voice. It's not the megas we've seen throughout Revelation. I noted when we looked at the chart of key words uh, how megas is 80 times in Revelation, and so many of them are in these chapters. But here it's a strong voice, not a great voice, although great mega voice is 20 times in Revelation, so this is uh, an exception here. Strong is a number of times, but it's not with voice so often. So there are two things that are perhaps special about this angel, the glory and the, the strong voice. But this is not special. We heard this exactly in 14.8. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. It has become a dwelling place of demons, a haunt of every foul and hateful bird, and a haunt of every foul and hateful beast. And we need to look at that up close because there's a lot of textual problems with that to look at. So the issue of fallen and then what follows here and all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication is splitting what we see in 14.8 into two parts. Let's go back and look at that briefly here. So the angel here said a sec in a second followed, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, identical to our verse. She has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And so as we go back, we see that both parts of that verse are replicated here. But two things are added. The, the question of the dwelling place of demons and animals and the kings uh, and the merchants uh, who are participating in this. But there's some problems in verse 2. And we need to look at that up close. So, as you can see from my note down below, some manuscripts have three phrases here. And they're not uh, related the way we see in the New RC at all. A prison for all unclean spirits, a prison for all unclean birds, and a prison for all unclean and hateful animals. Which is to say that in Greek, the word for prison, phulake, is three times, and the word for clean, akatharta, excuse me, akatharta, is three times, but the word for hateful is only once. Contrary to the new RSV here, which has foul for, for unclean twice, hateful twice, and doesn't have this phrase about spirits. Most translations have these two, these first two, and leave out the one about animals. Uh, so I can't explain why the new RSV authors, uh, editors, uh, did it the way they did, but this is how they have it here. But more manuscripts have a prison, or, a, or in this case a haunt, same word, uh, two possible meanings, for unclean spirits and unclean birds without the hateful. So let's look a little more closely at that. Um, become a dwelling place. The word for dwelling place here um, is only here in Ephesians in the New Testament. It's an unusual word here. Uh, Kadio Katerion. Um, but the idea of a dwelling place for demons is clearly taken from Isaiah, and we saw that in our uh, echoes from Hebrew Scripture, which we can go back to uh, here and see that echo as well. Um, there's also uh, an important thing to note here, and this is what I was uh, hinting at about the words, the place of demons, which is actually a rare word in Revelation. We saw it in chapter 9 for those who refuse to repent of their worship of demons. And we see it here in 1614, which is the demonic spirits that were like frogs that were coming out of the mouth there. Um, and in here, the only place that demons are mentioned. We might be surprised at a text full with the dragon and beasts. There'd be more uh, talk about demons, but they're not. John uses the, lang the other language instead of this language, like the synoptics, especially Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Uh, excuse me, the synoptics, not John, use. Uh, and we already noted here the word for haunt, uh, fulake. 
But uh, the word for foul here is, as I said, uh, akathartu, three times in the verse, despite the translation, clearly echoing Leviticus 11, 13, and 19, which is to say the birds that are unclean to eat. Uh, and so Babylon has become a place full of food you can't eat, animals you can't eat, and birds you can't eat. Um, much like uh, this image from Chernobyl. Um, after the nuclear disaster, Chernobyl is filled with animals, but similarly kind of animals, foxes and eagles and other kinds of animals like this, um, looking like it's a wonderful place, but the dark side of that is many of those are mutated by radiation as well. But without humans there, creation comes back, and that's much of what John is suggesting here. The image of a Babylon as a wilderness or as empty is also one we'd hear from Romans, who by the time of, their, of the first century, the ancient Roman city of Babylon, the great imperial city, was really just uh, ruins in a desert. So John knew that, and Romans knew that, even though that was a long way from his audience in Roman Asia, in what's now Western Turkey. Um, if they were educated, they knew that, which is to say, empires always fall. Rome may have been thriving at the time, and it certainly was at the time of John's vision, but Babylon was not. And that's his way of saying that from God's perspective, all empires fall except the kingdom of God. And why should you be loyal to and expect salvation from something that is inevitably going to be filled with uncleanness and demonic spirits? Um, and uh, there it is, already happened. Notice, not a prediction of the future, has become. Fallen, fallen is Babylon. And I really want to emphasize that here against the kind of readings that see the whole book of Revelation as a prediction of some future time, whether it's our time or some other time between the first century and now. It's plainly not that, and that's simply an incorrect reading. Uh, that John's vision shows that in his time, Babylon as a symbolic host of empire had already fallen, and there's nothing about the future in here. The only aspect about the future, as we saw some of the articles trying to apply it to current issues, is the patterns are so similar that we can look out and see similar patterns today, whether that's like Chernobyl or other powerful empires that fall because they're grounded in violence and lies rather than love and inclusion. Uh, so this is not a prediction of something, it's a description from God's perspective. And then finally in verse 3, at the end of our beginning dirge, for all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, again the phrase we've seen repeatedly, but the phrase all the nations here is part of what de Villiers shows is the, the frame for the chiasm uh, that we see through, uh, from the beginning and end. So all the nations have drunk of the wine, and then we see at the end here, and all the nations were deceived by your sorcery, um, which is to say the same thing. Um, which is say to be uh, drunk is to have your mind not clear and of course sor the idea of sorcery is that it clouds your mind as well. So they've been misled by imperial propaganda into believing that what Babylon stands for will bring them life but they're all going to lament that just momentarily. Um, not all the nations but at least the merchants and the kings and the seafarers will. And that's where we begin to see the, the uh, added people here. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and this is plainly yet another example of why this is not about literal sexual sexuality or human beings at all in terms of human sexuality. The kings are committing fornication with a city, which is to say they're engaging in imperial intercourse. Um, and we'll see the description of that right at the center of the chiasm with the cargo list that everybody is lamenting has been lost at sea um, in the judgment of Babylon. So the kings and then the merchants. For the first time here, the empori, from which, of course, through the Latin, we get the word emporium, um, the, the people who buy and sell on the sea. And that leads to a little image here from um, this poem from John Maysfield, uh, writing at the beginning of the 20th century, but I think expressing some of what we're going to see around these merchants. I won't look at it in detail now, but we'll look at it in more detail when we look at the actual cargo. But which is to say that both in John's time and in Maysfield's time in the early 20th century, the seas were filled with merchants growing rich from the power of the luxury of empire. And we'll see what happens next time when another voice from heaven calls, come out of her, my people, so you do not take part in her sins. See you for that next time. Bye-bye.